Hi, um, let's see if we can um, try something new. Uh, we'll talk about density estimation in this uh, episode. And let's see. So just to get us into the zone, uh, let's recall uh, the topic that we already discussed, Bayesian decision boundary. So what we have is two posterior distributions for class one and class two. And if posterior distribution for class one, probability of omega one given X is greater than posterior distribution for class two, then we decide for class one, right? Look at the uh, plot so posterior for class two is the red one and when it's greater in those regions we decide for class uh, for class two when on the other hand class one no um, I'm kind of reversing um, what I'm saying and what's um, in, in my notes here. But basically, if class one is higher in those regions, then we decide for class one. Or when class two is higher in these regions, then we decide for class, uh, for um, uh, class two. But uh, what really is happening there that we are, um, well, by doing so, we're minimizing probability of uh, error given data. So Bayesian, we're minimizing Bayesian error. We're just selecting for each of the given points. Um, we're selecting um, according to the rules above according to the decision boundary, or, um, well, we'll see now, a likelihood ratio. But we still have an error, say, when at this point, we are deciding that this value of the feature uh, tells us that this is class one, there's still an error possibility of error for class two. Uh, and uh, the basically what we're doing is we're minimizing the error. We're just taking, okay, if we will, um, uh, in this class, if we predict class, in this case, if we predict class one, our error is smaller. So that's what we're doing. And in this case, reverse, if we predict class two, our error is smaller than. Uh, but um, what we are actually getting at is decision boundary. Uh, those points uh, or this curve or the surface uh, um, along which posteriors for one class is equal to posterior for the uh, other class. So this is the decision boundary. And uh, the decision boundary, when you deal with it, has um, equality of posterior is kind of hard to use as a decision boundary. So what we use is instead is likelihood ratio, because you can write your posterior as the uh, product of your likelihood and your prior called likelihood ratio, but in fact, it's um, we take a log of this ratio and then we guarantee that when they're equal, the ratio is one and um, log is zero. So uh, this is our decision boundary. Um, so non-parametric density estimation. So far, we have assumed that either the likelihoods uh, were known, and then we could do the likelihood ratio test. 
or at least their parametric form was known. And then we could do maximum likelihood estimation of the parameters from the data and still do the uh, estimate, um, uh, estimate the decision boundary and um, or do the, the, the likelihood ratio test again. But what if we have, um, all we have is data and we don't want to make any assumptions about parametric form of the distribution or the data is just telling us that parametric form of this distribution may be too difficult to derive or deal with. Can we do something in this case just from the data uh, non-parametrically without assuming some form um, uh, of the distribution of the likelihood in this case? And well, yeah, that's a challenging and well, that's an exciting problem. All we have is the data and we want to estimate the density uh, just using the data itself, not using a parametric form of this distribution and look parametrically representing a distribution like that would be uh, very hard or very difficult to, or at least um, it would be difficult to deal with um, if not uh, represented. So the first thing in the, in the problem like that, the first thing that should come to mind is something that you've seen millions of times is histogram, right? Histogram is a simplest form of non-parametric density estimation. How we do that, how we compute the histogram, we divide the samples into a number of pins. And then approximate the density by the fraction of training data uh, that falls into each pin. So we have our training sample. We estimate the distribution as, uh, you know, for each pin, we compute the counts. And then after we've done that, we get a new point and use this equation on the board, uh, on the slide, um, to compute the probability of this point according to the data that uh, is um, uh, representing the density, the underlying density. It's just count of um, training samples that fail in the same bean um, as our sample divided by the bean width and divided by the total number of training samples. So um, there are variations, the bean width may not be constant and things like that. But uh, just two things to divide, um, bean width and first bean starting position. Uh, that's all we need to define um, as our hyperparameters. With those hyperparameters, we can now estimate this function. Yeah, the histogram there, um, all familiar uh, histogram. Looks very nice and so comforting in one dimensional case, but in two dimensional and largest dimensional case becomes very, very problematic. So few problems uh, with histogram is density estimate depends on the starting bin position. So depending on where you start, in your um, uh, in the in the like you're given a data set data points so how how you carve it will give you a different density estimator depending on how you car how you carve this uh, into bins and then um, histogram has discontinuities of the estimate um, and those discontinuities yeah are artifact of the chosen bin location they're not like truly in the data or some property of the data. So, and of course the problem that you already guessed when I started uh, talking about multi multiple dimensions is the curse of dimensionality. Since the number of bins grows exponentially with the number of dimensions. Um, yeah, like we have uh, remember our figure with 3D So we have h power d uh, 
of parameters to estimate for histogram. And the larger is the dimension, the less is the chance probability of um, any points uh, hitting most of the bins. So most of the bins um, will become empty because we will end up empty and we'll have no estimate of probability density at those positions. So histogram is unsuitable for most practical applications. Expect, expect for quick visualization in one or two dimensions. Yeah, uh, for one dimension it's good, good enough. But so let's leave it alone. Let's not work with it at all for any kind of interesting serious application. Like your homework, well, like your next homework on um, naive base. Well, what to do instead? Uh, let's in, let's instead try something different. Non-parametric density estimation. That is not a histogram. So to see what we're trying to do, let's see what where we're going. What are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to estimate or to represent the probability that um, x sample from the true probability density will fall in a given region of the sample space. So probability of uh, a sample falling within a given region of a sample space is just an integral of the density, right? In one dimensional case, what's the probability that your value falls between A and B? So you take an integral between A and B of the density, right? And uh, of course we're doing uh, the, the tick mark here because this is the variable of integration and this is the X variable of interest. So probability of X falling within R is just the integral of the density. Good old uh, probability theory, nothing interesting yet. When we have a sequence of uh, random vectors, uh, we want to estimate probability that k of those vectors that we sampled randomly from the distribution uh, p from this one uh, will fall in this region. We know that probability of falling inside of this region is theta and outside of this region one minus theta. Now you see the familiar Bernoulli distribution. But in a sequence of n draws and samples, how many will fall into uh, that region R is that theta distribution. And uh, the actual probability of falling in that region R um, or the probability of a specific number of the samples falling within this region R is um, the binomial distribution here on the slide. All of the possible, um, all of the all, all of the possible combinations, um, or all of the possible uh, sequences of um, k samples falling within that region uh, in uh, the Bernoulli distribution. So from properties of this binomial uh, probability mass function, uh, we know that the mean um, uh, of uh, k over n is theta, and the variance of k over n uh, depends on n. So from this, you can see that uh, as n grows uh, to infinity, variance reduces, mean stays the same, but variance reduces and we can obtain a good estimate of the probability um, uh, a, good, a good estimate of theta as k over n, uh, as, uh, as n goes to infinity. So I assume now that this region is so small that probability density doesn't much change across that region. So then in this case, we can model this integral of probability density function as a product of probability density at x. So I 
x is here, say, if we are assuming that we're shrinking this region, further such that the density doesn't change. So at some point this region becomes so small that um, we can still, we can just assume, okay, this is constant. That's why it's just a product. In 1D, it's the length. In 2D, it will be the area because remember what we're computing is the volume of the, uh, uh, the integral, the volume under this, uh, uh, density under the curve. So then in 3D and 4D and so on, it becomes volume. Um, so same thing. And then now we know that uh, as n goes to infinity, a good estimator for theta is k over n. But uh, look here, theta equals probability density times v and also equals, I mean, approximated by k over n. Rearranging, we can obtain an approximation to probability density as k over n times v. k is number of samples that fell into the volume, the specific volume v out of our random sample and n is our total uh, size sample size so with this we obtain a more accurate estimate um, by increasing n as shrinking and shrinking v so we need to shrink v small enough that we can assume that probability density is flat or unchanging within this volume then we kind of um, guaranteed that we're not too much off here when we're approximating theta or, or actually when we're approximating this integral. And yet for this to be a good approximation, n needs to go to infinity. So v needs to go to zero and n needs to go to infinity. And then this will be a good estimate of um, our probability density. All right probability density of the data. So some practical considerations. As volume approaches uh, zero, R encloses no examples. Obvious, right? It's smaller and smaller and smaller, and then our sample is finite. At some point, it will be harder to find any examples in those volumes. So you have a point a new point that you want to estimate probably well, let, let me go back um, you have a new sample and you're telling me okay i have x i know it comes from this distribution but what is the probability of x and then if this went uh, goes to zero then you and you need other samples within that volume but you don't have any samples around x within that volume that's what i'm trying to say there so uh, we need to find some compromise for V. We need to um, choose V such that it's kind of proportional to number of samples so we can have something within the volume. So, but the general expression for non-parametric density then becomes as on the screen um, right there. Yeah. Uh, still the same as before, it's just, we're separating, remember what we had on the other slide, we're separating N and V, um, and V is the volume surrounding, uh, surrounding that point that you want to, it's actually that curvy X, um, this one, but um, it's a vector X in a multidimensional space anyways. N is the total number of examples, and K is number of examples inside the volume. So for curve convergence of this uh, estimator, we need to provide for the following. Um, the limit as N goes to infinity of volume should be zero. Uh, the limit of uh, number of points that fall within this volume should be infinity. 
and the limit of the ratio of k over n should be zero. That's, that means the number of total samples and the number of samples that fell within the volume. They're just so small that they uh, um, the number of total samples is much larger or and grows much faster. So how do we do that? So we can do it two ways. We can guarantee that all those three limits go to their expected values or the uh, desired values with two approaches. One is by fixing volume and estimating K. That is kernel density estimation. Another one is by fixing K and estimating volume. And this is the K nearest neighbor approach. Both are powerful, both can be used for density estimation, both can be used for, well, and um, both can be used for density estimation and K nearest neighbor approach can be also used for classification. So let's first talk about the examples on um, the slide. As we go from left to right, the number of samples grows. Like we have only one sample here, four samples. And um, this is our uh, first approach kernel density estimation, and this is our um, second approach. We fix k to um, k nearest neighbor, we fix k to square root of the total samples. And in the volume approach in the KDE kernel density estimation, we fix the volume to one over square root of n um, of our samples. And um, as our number of samples increases, our k increases, or our volume decreases, and we um, get better and better estimates of the probability density function uh, of um, that generated this data sample that we have. Um, just a couple of words because I'm not going to go through the k nearest neighbor um, classifier. K nearest neighbor classifier is okay. Um, very uh, powerful, very interesting, and uh, very simple conceptually. If um, we had a lot, a lot of data, it would give us very good uh, results. And um, uh, it's just, okay, take a sample, look at the neighbors, at k nearest neighbors, 100 neighbors, and if they belong, the majority of them, belong to one class, just declare that your sample is also likely to be this class. Um, surprisingly, when you have a lot of data, how successful this classifier is. The problem with this classifier, it's non-parametric, and it depends on all of your data staying with you every time you do a classification. So if you, if you collected I don't know, 100 million samples or uh, 100 uh, uh, billion samples, say, you will get really good results that will probably beat any of your other models. But all of your samples must be there with you all the time. That means, okay, computational, uh, it's computationally problematic, and it is also privacy problematic. If your samples they relate to your customers, to your humans, customers, you have to always have them with you and uh, run uh, the classifier on them by taking a new sample of a product or query and looking at surrounding neighbors. Computationally expensive, it becomes um, in large dimensional spaces when you need to quickly uh, compute um, nearest neighbors. That means you need to quickly search through your whole database of billion examples and find the nearest neighbors. There are data structures which you should know from your um, uh, computational geometry classes, at least. KG3 is one of them um, that uh, partitions the space in such a way that it becomes easier and faster to find uh, those uh, nearest neighbors, but it's still not fast enough when you have a lot of neighbors and the dimensionality is large. So people have 
done a lot of estimates, uh, approximate data structures for nearest neighbor search. But enough for uh, about the k nearest neighbor. Just remember, next time you see a problem, maybe yeah, try simple classifiers first, like logistic regression. I hope you appreciated it um, in the logistic from the logistic regression uh, lecture, and like nearest neighbor, k nearest neighbor classifier. Try them at least as a baseline, and you can think about whether you're going to use them in practice or not, depending on the result. But um, for many, just remember, for many or surprisingly many applications, k-nearest neighbor and logistic regression will be the any of your modern um, tools. So don't start with the most complicated models if you see the problem for the first time and you don't know how hard it is. OK, what do we do next? How do we um, estimate uh, our density using kernel density estimation? What is the kernel in our case? Let's talk, uh, talk about the simplest possible kernel, arguably called Parson Windows due to um, Emmanuel Parson, I believe the uh, name of the statistician, who was one of the first who invented uh, it. And of course, he wasn't the first. Um, Rosenblatt was the first, but the name stuck. So assume the region R in closing k examples is a hypercube with the side of length h centered at x. So x is our point of interest. We are interested in predicting the value of x, uh, the probability, the value of probability density at x here. So let's center a hypercube around this x. If you're in D, it's just a square in 3D in the picture. And once it grows, we keep adding dimensions, but it's still a hypercube. So one observation to note about this hypercube is that the distance to the nearest facet, to any facet from the center of the hypercube that has length h, is h over 2. Think about it. That should be clear. Like you'll get lost if you if this is not immediately clear. So the volume is also obviously h power d. So we just the area is h square. The volume is h cube. But it's three dimensions. In d dimensions is h power d because we're just multiplying uh, all of the uh, lengths or all of the sides of the hypercube. So to find the number of examples that fall within this region, we define a window function, also known, also known as kernel. So kernel k of u takes a u, and if it's in, in absolute value less than 1 half, we are declaring that the point u is within the hypercube. If it's more than 1 half or equal to 1 half, it's outside of the hypercube. So it's kind of an indicator function that tells us whether the It's an indicator function that is telling us whether a point falls within a hypercube or not. And considered uh, as written, it does not involve any actual dimension. This kernel function on, on the slide is dimensionless. So k of u assumes that the hypercube is centered at the origin and has side lengths 1. Then you can see that, OK, that's true, right? If h is 1 and this is the origin here, 
then um, this kernel will return correct results. But we are not always interested only in the estimate of the density, probability density, only at the origin, right? We want our probability density anywhere and everywhere. Well, you see this is done for convenience because um, this is a parsing window or the naive estimator and corresponds to a unit hypercode centered at the origin. Okay, that's what I said. Now, to generalize this beyond the origin, we use the trick that before passing our function x, uh, that the x is the center of the hypercube. And Um, yes, x uh, sub n, so our sample, um, and uh, scale, uh, the difference, so what we do, we compute the difference between the new center of the hypercube and a point of interest normalized by the actual linear size, linear length of our hypercube. And this, uh, the side is h. And uh, you can see after this normalization, this number will be precisely u. And we'll plug it into this kernel. And uh, we'll, this kernel will return correct answers. 1, if it's inside of the hypercube centered at x with side length h and 0 if it's outside. That's how we're scaling and translating this kernel anywhere we want. Scaling, uh, sorry, scaling and translating. So spend some time on this slide if this simple algebra is not clear. So let's look at an example of how parsing windows work. Uh, so one dimensional case, we have few points and we want to compute probability at x. We have point x1, x2, x3, and x4. And at this point, we want to compute what is the probability uh, density function? What is the value of probability density function? So we choose our kernel uh, as such, our uh, um, yeah, our, our our volume is that length uh, that we selected, and um, let's see. So the total number of points in, inside the hypercube is uh, just the sum of everything. And look how convenient it is. We're summing across all of our training points. But those that are outside of the cube, they will um, uh, return 0, right? The indicator function will return 0. So there are two alternative views on the problem because this is symmetric. Remember, our kernel computes. an absolute value. So either we can think of the problem the way I said on the first slide as, OK, just put a hypercube around the new point that you'd like to uh, work with and uh, find the nearest neighbors or find the points that fall within this region, within that hypercube. Uh, well, this one dimensional, so you can see. And then we're done. We can just compute the k and then use our estimate k over n. Uh, or um, another alternative view is 
um, ignore uh, the need to find which points are near your new point. Instead, consider each of your training points in the set and this new point whether that point falls within their cubes their hypercubes see what we're doing um the, so like we are sequentially going through all of our training data points and just checking if the new point falls inside or doesn't and then we're integrating or summing up the values. So it'll give us one here, one here, one here, and zero for x4. And thus we got an our estimate for a kernel density estimate of the probability function if if we do this and uh, for person windows for person window it's uh, the v so this true uh, this trick uh, computes the k and as before when we are approximating probability density function at x as k over n over b so v is this and this is here but k is just the number of points that fall within the volume surrounding x but often and well because of the symmetry of situation the limited number of points in the training class, it is simple to just go through all of the points and check whether the new point, the point of interest, falls within their volume and just count the number of times when it does. That's equivalent symmetric situation. So Parson Windows resembles a histogram, uh, but the um, uh, bin location is determined by the data now. So even if you have like a histogram carves up the space sort of in a grid uniformly. With Parson windows, you have um, if you have a point far away or some points denser here, uh, sparser somewhere outside there in the in the in the uh, in the domain of your distribution, then um, you still can compute the probability there, despite um, this non-uniform sampling or non-uniform densities, thanks to this um, symmetry property. So partisan windows. What's the role of the kernel function? Let's look closer at, um, at this. So let's compute the expectation of the estimate this is our estimate this is not true probability density function of x this is probability density function under our process kde so what's the expectation where does this process converge to right under the probability that the data so what what does this mean this means we take an integral with respect to true probability of x of this estimator so that that's what this notation means but then if we open up the estimator and by linearity of expectation integral over sum is sum of integral we, we can write this that it's a sum over expectation of the kernel uh, values and in the in uh, uh, in the limit 
uh, we we can just uh, yes we can just um, drop the sum um, because we're now within the expectation anyways integrate over all possible x sub n uh, x let's write them as x tick and um, what we'll see here when we again expand the expectation um, when the variable of integration is subtracted over the, um, from the variable of interest what happens is the kernel is flipped so you can do the algebra yourself uh, that doesn't work that well uh, let's not be too creative so if my kernel looks like that, and I'm doing this, I'm uh, moving, I'm fixing x, and I'm integrating over all po uh, possible values, x minus those values, what I'm actually doing is I'm flipping the kernel, and I'm kind of sliding this kernel along this probability density function. like that so I'm sliding it back and forth along the probability density function so what we see here that the uh, when we use the kernel and estimate our kernel density estimator it's equivalent it, it's a convolution of the true density which we don't know but it's a convolution of the true density with this kernel function that's what kernel density estimator does under the hood. And as our um, kernel width or the volume or equivalently as the kernel approaches Dirac delta function, uh, kernel density approaches true density. So as this approaches delta function, this whole integral is just the integral of the true density and our expectation becomes the, our true density true value let's do an exercise we'll need our parson window kernel as a reminder and we'll need definition of how do we compute or estimate the probability of x given our training data remember that's how we did it so what if our training data is this four five five six whatever this is our data set right you can see it and uh, the task homework well this this one is just so you understand what we're doing mechanically uh, I hope you all already understand and you're watching all of this at uh, two times the speed that I'm telling, um, recording this. But um, anyways, let's go through it, through this exercise, excruciatingly slow, but I want you to be comfortable and uh, understand completely what's going on. So we need to estimate the density, unknown density given by this data at those places, three, 10, 15, and, uh, our uh, parameter, our volume or um, hypercube side is four, but since the data is one dimensional, it's just the length. Um, the red points are the data from the set. The locations here is what we need to estimate, where we need to estimate the probability. So we go through all of our points and just count uh, and just see if 0.3 falls into the um, region. So if we center, let's compute three. So what we do is start from this point four, 
length is four. So one, two, three minus four divided by four for this point. Then three minus five divided by four will uh, appear here twice. So this is true, this is one. But then even when H is four, this is zero because remember we have um, strict uh, strict inequality here. So we've shifted our kernel and then we go further. But as you can see, there is no need to consider those points, but we kind of do. We follow the book, just exact, um, exact um, algorithm and compute up to this point. All of them are zero, only one is one. And uh, the volume is the length for power one, one dimensional, and four comes from here. And we got our probability density, value of our probability density of our estimated probability density. So we're estimating the true one with the kernel density estimate. Well, now let's compute the value here. And again, we are going through all of them. For all of this, it's zero. And even for this one, it's zero. And for the rest, it's zero. And that's what we estimated as well. And then for the last one, the situation is much more interesting. For this four points, the probability uh, the indicator for this four points, point 15 does fall within the hypercube, hypercube, excuse me. And for this point and the rest, it doesn't. So we have four ones, all the rest are zeros. And we estimate probability as 0 0.1. So I hope that's, that's clear how this estimator is used. Um, the cumbersomeness or the difficulty is that, look, all of those points have to be stored and visited every time you estimate the density. So your training data, it's kind of like an ideal memory. You don't make any, um, mm. this is for the those people who love to learn by pattern matching. Um, so instead of, uh, understanding, I would say, and making inferences and building compressed models, kernel density estimation remembers everything. And then by pattern matching, by comparison, finds the correct values. Are they correct? We'll find out. So the, the problem with bars and windows is, uh, or all of these cubes, there are a few problems. It's density estimates have discontinuities still. It's a, it's a sharp cube, right? Uh, and then um, another problem, it's because it's cube and because it's indicator, it's like there is a point that is right here and there is a point right here. The um, parson window doesn't care. It weights bo weighs all of them, both of them, both of those two points, one and two sort of equally, they are both equally important for bars and windows. But uh, maybe the ones that are closer should be more important than the ones that, that are farther apart. So um, often we prefer a smooth kernel and often we use a smooth kernel. So a kernel uh, to work has to obey a few principles, a few requirements. It has to be non-negative, so zero or larger at any, any, any point. And it also has to integrate to one uh, within, uh, within the domain that it's defined on. And um, usually we prefer 
it isn't it's not a requirement but um, usually we prefer radially symmetric and unimodal uh, kernels for example this radial basis function where this is just like the gaussian and, uh, without any covariance matrix and because of that we don't care too much about normalization by the way but uh, yet we do uh, it, it's nice when it normalizes to one uh, but um, in generally for radial basis functions we don't expect them to normalize to one uh, and then the radially symmetric is that property that allowed you in your homework to sample uniformly any angle in multidimensional space because the uh, Gaussian probability density is radially symmetric so this function is as well radially symmetric but we have um, just use it in our density estimator now so our kernel um, as you see here is uh, now radial basis function so we used to have a hypercube in parson windows for 2d now we have a bell-shaped curve um, radially symmetric radial basis function and um, it also changes depending on the number of samples if you have a smaller number of samples uh, or well this is just an example of the width in the 2D kernel. So you can regulate the width uh, by still using H here. Uh, the smaller the H, uh, the narrower the function. Okay, and um, the larger the H, the wider the function. So let's try to think about what we're seeing and what we're doing with it. So smooth kernels estimate, um, what they estimate is a sum of pumps. Like you, at each point in your data set, you put a little bump or a large bump, depending on uh, your age parameter. And then um, kernel function determines the shape of these bumps. And parameters age is smoothing parameter determines their width. You will see why this smoothing parameter. So each point in the training sample in your data you just put a bell uh, shaped curve on top of that but when you add them up together you get this uh, more interesting curve um, interestingly uh, if you um, just a smaller side you can estimate Gaussian um, with those kernels you can estimate um, any function or you can approximate any function the more fun uh, the more kernels like that you add you can uh, approximate any function using the basis of those functions of those bell-shaped functions and if we talk about those uh, bell-shaped functions as Gaussian functions then uh, we say that Gaussians are universal um, function approximator. The basis of Gaussian functions, you know, functions uh, is universal function approximator. We can approximate any function with the Gaussians, with the pumps. So another um, example is um, um, how to set the kernel width. We can set it to two or we can set it to five. But as the data goes to infinity, remember Bayesian learning, our prior, whatever we set the um, uh, kernel width to doesn't matter, they all approach the true density. But the way they do it is kind of weird, right? With one sample uh, for a very small kernel, it's a uh, nicely looking function, but um, well, it only only looks nice um, for one sample, but then it's kind of spiky and delta function. Well, of course, this is just artifact of plotting. If you plot it smoothly with higher resolution grid, there will be smooth bumps, uh, smooth bumps. But still, um, the point is that uh, if you don't have enough data, your prior knowledge may give you better estimate like this of the final uh, result uh, but when you have lots of data 
um, your choice of hyperparameters doesn't that much matter, at least in this application. So uh, how do we select, how do we know when to select larger uh, age or smaller age bandwidth of this kernel function? So smaller age gives you a spiky estimate. If uh, you choose too large of the um, too large age, too large bandwidth, uh, the bandwidth that is too large, you get over smoothed estimate, which one is better. So large age over smooth is the density estimation uh, hidden structure. Uh, well, it hides, it smooths out the structure. And small yields a spiky uninterpretable density estimation. Well, in general, the problem is unsolvable um, as always, but we can do something in practice. So we can pick age that minimizes the error between the estimated density and the true density. Well, just just to it. Yes, we don't know the true density, but we can still assume. So let us use a mean squared error for measuring this error. So mean squared error, mean squared error between our estimate and the truth. If we write it down like that, we can decompose the mean squared error. Well, we can decompose the square easily. I think surprising. Then we can regroup because this is just an integral. Uh, and we have three integrals now. And since uh, uh, I guess, uh, so what, what, that, what happens here, your integral of px with respect to something dx that's your expectation and when you do px with respect to bx uh, you'll get bx that's this uh, it's this and the same happens with square um, just precisely because um, the variable of integration goes through all possible values and this x is that x is x at which you want to estimate the value so that's why um, p of x and p of x squared just fall out. Um, okay, that, I hope that's clear. So then we do some black magic. We add and subtract a um, square of the expectation. Nothing changes. We add and subtract. But adding and subtracting leads us um, gives us a way to rearrange a little bit and what we get is the mean where our kernel density estimator will converge minus the true value of the probability density of unknown probability density at, uh, at x squared plus expectation of a square of our estimate minus the square of the expectation of our estimate and expectation of our square of square minus the square of the expectation is nothing but variance and this is bias this is bias because okay this is where our estimate will converge and this gives us the difference between that point that it will converge at and the true value. When they're equal, if it converges to the true value, then bias is zero. And well, this is a typical example of bias various trade-off, and we'll come back to it in later lectures. But here's an example, a uh, visual example. So when we have low variance, low, um, the distribution is not diffused. You hit very closely all the time. You can be you can have very low variance, always hit the same point, but you can be completely wrong. That is 
the bias. Or you can have high variance and be completely wrong. Or you can have high variance and be sort of right. So we sometimes often can add some variance and um, hit the point more correctly. Uh, or like um, what Bayesian approach is advocating for, instead of being super precise and estimate one parameter and declare, uh, declare victory, Bayesian approach advocates to estimate all of your uh, uncertainties and then maybe you'll be in this situation where you're not so super certain that's why you're smoother and have more uh, variance in your estimator but you you will at least capture um, capture your um, true value that you're uh, trying to approximate and you will tell the uh, researcher or whoever runs this analysis that look this estimate is uncertain it's like the variance is too high so don't don't bet on this too much whereas this um, high bias low low variance estimates are over optimistic and um, incorrect um, so what it translates to in the model training model selection this bias variance trade-off problem is that once you tr start increasing um, decreasing your bias your variance grows and so um, and we will see that with the kernel density estimates in the next slide so uh, there is some optimal point where the bias is still not too high is already not too high is kind of lowish and variance is not too high either yet so if you go further with reducing bias you introduce a lot of variance here's an example if our kernel um, width is too high we're over smoothing we're biased the true density is blue and the kernel density kernel width is too high so we introduce bias and uh, we smoothly approximate something that is not true or if our kernel density our kernel width is too low we introduce a lot of variance we're, we're super uh, correct sort of we're unbiased but we introduce a lot of variance so how do we deal with that how to select the bandwidth for the kernel in kernel density estimation uh, such that um, uh, we at least have some guarantees or some reassurance that uh, what we're estimating has something to do with um, the ground truth true distribution so we can make subjective choices so plot multiple curves and uh, curves and choose the estimate that best matches subjective ideas like we can see uh yeah this distribution couldn't be that spiky and so on and so forth but this can only be done in low dimensional data right not too practical in high dimensional data uh, or um if we can assume that our data is gaussian is normal so for gaussian distribution we can analytically derive multiple things so we can minimize overall mean squared error and if we can do that the true gaussian this minimum um argument h star is 1.06 times the variance of the gaussian and number of samples the negative uh, one over five power one fifth uh this slide is full of magic numbers so we can obtain better results if we change the magic number 1.1.06 into 0 0.9 and uh, use interquantile range IQR divided by 
another, yet another point, well, magic point number. And if we do that, this is kind of rule of thumb, um, normal distribution approximation, or Silverman's rule of thumb. You can read about it in Wikipedia, at least rule of thumb of bandwidth selection estimator. Uh, can fail miserably if your data is non-Gaussian, by the way, if it's by model, even consists of two Gaussians. And again, check an example on uh, Wikipedia. So what do we do when we have uh, multivariate densities? So in when you have multiple dimensions, um, and use parsing windows, for example, or symmetric kernel, a uh, radial basis kernel, then H is the same for all axes, so this density estimate is weighting all axes equally. That's not always desirable. Uh, it's, it may be a problem if one or several of the features have larger spread than the others. Like you have larger uncertainty or just naturally a larger variance uh, in one of the features. Uh, I don't know, color of feathers in a parakeet uh, may be highly variable, whereas size of the beak is the same. And um, well, th things like that. So, um, and a couple of hacks to fix this is pre-scale each axis. So we can apply a scalar and force all of the axes to be within the same scale. We can also pre-widen the data that comes from our PCA and KL transform. So if we compute the covariance of our data and then compute, well, this is practically KL transform, right? Or close to, and uh, we take our axes, put them as rows of our larger matrix X, and then do compute this XX transpose matrix a and decompose it. V, v, uh, v, v transpose, and that's what this lambda square root of negative square root of lambda. Oh, not negative square root of lambda. It's basically one over lambda. Uh, one over square root of lambda. I for the diagonals, and then we widen the data. Basically, we rotated and scaled all of the eigenvalue. Rotated in the space of eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of our data, and then scaled all of the axes proportionally to their eigenvalues. And then we can estimate the density and then transform everything back by the inverse transform. Or we can just use hyper ellipsoidal kernel that does this all implicitly. Well, if using hacky solutions is not your thing, then we can use product kernels. And product kernels go like that. Okay, we have individual kernel parameters are um, larger kernel or encompassing kernel uh, contains all of the individual kernels, but we model this kernel as a product of those little kernels for all of those dimensions, all of the separate dimensions, and of course, normalizing by uh, steel by their volume. So it consists of the product of one dimensional kernels, uh, but kernel independence does not imply feature independence. Features can still be dependent, it's just a way to model the density. So, uh, unimodal distribution example, unimodal kernel density estimation. We take 100 data points, it's just this is a 3D rendition of this 2D uh, I, um, isodensity uh, lines uh, counterplot. So we have counterplot and we have um, 
two-dimensional blood. So the, the, this is the true density because we know the functional form. We can just plot it. And then we used the rule of thumb. Uh, for setting the width, and we use sort of theoretical Gaussian here, and uh, you can see for yourself which one looks better. And then for bimodal, when we have uh, two densities, um, what we see uh, for bimodal with the same points with the same settings. Uh, basically, when we assume Gaussian, what it does, um, look how spiky this distribution is. And both of those, well, they're not too different in this case. Uh, both of them are over smoothing. They're just biased, just biased when um, it's by model distribution, they're both over smoothing. Well, um, I think that's a good. Uh, sort of shallow introduction of uh, kernel density estimation. I hope it's practical. What you need to get out of this, you need to understand how to use the kernel estimates and uh, the walkthrough examples that I gave you should help you. And um, uh, yeah, that's, that's the main point, how kernel density estimation works. Uh, how to mechanically sort of use it uh, when you need to estimate your probability density non-parametrically without assuming any functional form. Um, we will talk um, about how to estimate what's um, yeah what's on the screen right now uh, uh, parametrically as a sum of the Gaussians of a few Gaussians, which is not that easy. Uh, we need. Uh, latent variable modeling for that, which we haven't covered yet. But um, with non-parametric estimation, you just need to understand that your data is basically your memory. You always have to have your data with you in order to re-estimate this density and compute the probability. But you can use this approach for regression, like uh, not just classification. k those neighbors will give you classification but you can also compute regression if you do the same trick as kernel density estimate, but just for this one variable of interest, y, and then you can, um, given a new, new feature set, you can predict age of a person or um, uh, any kind of continuous value by using the same trick by using non-parametric density estimation. There are other interesting non-parametric methods that we don't have time to cover in this class, but I highly recommend you to look at. They include uh, spline interpolation and throw into Gaussian processes that are also interesting non-parametric methods. And um, uh, yeah, a few of others, but thank you. That's all I have for this episode.